Yeah, my name is Don Capria, and I'm the author of Colombo the Unsolved Murder, and I am chatting with Stax. And I'm going to a major organized crime bust. 23 people under arrest now accused of stealing guns and cash. Today, police revealed four organized crime groups are wreaking havoc. From aggravated robbery to kidnapping, burglary, and more. Let's take a look at this. New pictures from court documents in this case. These are a few of the people who have been charged. And investigators say the money, tens of thousands of dollars, is all stolen. Welcome to this episode of Chatting with Stacks. I'm your host, Bill Stacks, and today I got Don Capria. And did Anthony ever tell you anything about Scarpa, Greg Scarpa? Yeah, we talked a lot about Scarpa because it was directly involved with his father's uh, his father's story. Um, and and for those that don't know, I mean, he's probably the first made person in an organized crime family to become a government informant they called it the top echelon informant um and that was in 1962 or 63 um he was he was arrested for a, a robbery and and then he started cooperating with the fbi um he is another one he's he, he would have a podcast today if he could for sure you know with the one eye and and aids that guy would he'd be out there preaching like he was like a, like he's a preacher you know his he's son a, is his son's it, his it's, son's got a plug yeah. it, it's it's unreal to me it's really unreal we 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 don't value honor we don't those are just their words um and it's it's sad that these kids are over here excited by these guys because they think they're tough in some way and i i think that just also lends to the lack of masculinity that's out there is that you really think that this guy's is for real he's serious because he committed crimes and snitched on everyone he knew and this you know even the, the relatives of it all too you know like i i think you know first in line was the same the bull's daughter was on like mob wives or something like yeah look at me i'm my father you know like and all it's just it's unapologetic they're unapologetically proud of these things and it's yeah. to me it's it's psychologically I, I i i just i don't get it at all um, but Scarpa was a, he did a lot of damage. Um, the one of the thing that he did talk to me a lot about because Scarpa and a lot of the paperwork tried to create, like he had a close relationship with Joe Colombo. Anthony told me, and he knew that his father never liked Greg Scarpa and never wanted him around. He, he, he they talked a few times about coming to the house and he really wouldn't let him in the house. So I think Joe Colombo had a nose for him, um, during the 1960s and really didn't care for him. Um, but he was definitely, I have Scarpa's jacket with the FBI and he was, uh, man, he was given information on everything. That's why the Colombo crime family is one of the most publicized crime families is that, you know, the source information comes from the government informants. It goes to the FBI, the FBI leaks it to the NYPD and the CIB. And then that goes into the press pool. So, you know, it's just, it, it's like, you literally just give the mic to the rat and now, how do you substantiate any of this stuff? You, they don't. They don't need to. Why? Because the things that they're saying and the crimes that they're talking about, when it's printed into the paper, this helps the government get more funding, appropriate more funds to hire more men to go after this even further. Uh, one of the stories I wrote about in my book is about the torture chamber. And that is a prime example of how a false story made it to the media was promoted by the media when the cib nypd and the fbi knew the story was completely false they're the ones what, who leaked it. what is the story the torture chamber was a story about a bath beach uh social club in the 1960s and there was there was two men that were missing sally sally no nos was missing and his associate and the feds were just, you know, looking around for these guys, wondered why they hadn't surfaced in a while. They heard there was a, you know, a possible war happening within the Colombo crime family again. And they went into this social club, no warrant, no investigation, nothing. They go in the bathroom and there's blood. They they see blood. So they call the NYPD. Uh, they they search this place. They they shut it down and they ran with a false story that uh these guys were tortured in the back of this this uh, social club, Sally D. Boone, and it says a right, torture chamber was right on the front page of the, and, and I have the FBI jacket paperwork that says that they knew the story was false, but they, they wanted them to run with it because it was, you know, part of COINTELPRO, which was a counterintelligence program for media. So it was, it was a perfect example to talk about how the government wanted false stories that defamed people and made people, you know, and Joe Colombo was right there. You know, he's a, it was a, you know, this is a, a, a 
a power struggle that was happening within the family. These guys are probably dead. And then it turns out that the, the blood belonged to a kid from the social club. They, they were fighting over a car game and they said, go in the bathroom. These kids went in the bathroom and duked it out. And one of the kids broke the other kid's nose. So there was blood all over the bathhouse and they didn't completely clean it up. Uh, and, and that never made it to print. Did they ever find out what happened to the two guys? Um, Sally D. What happened to Sally D? I think Sally D never surfaced again. So the, the investigation side of it was correct. There was probably something going on. Um, he's a very popular, very popular gangster in the 1960s. He was the uh, the person that they modeled the scene in, in The Godfather when um, Frankie Five Angels goes into the bar and they hand him the hundred dollar bill uh and you know they, they start choking out frankie five angels and the cop comes in he's like why are the lights all out and they shoot the cop well that cops that's a whole that story puzo took that story verbatim from what happened in the sahara lounge with larry gallo, gallo and that cop, yeah, yeah La larry yeah. gallo was lured to the lounge during the gallo Pafachi war in 1959 and they had the lights dimmed and marvin blay was the cop who walked in and was like what's going on in here and Sally D is the guy who shot him, hit him, hit him in the head, and he lived. And and when the trial came up, the officer looking at Sally D could not ID him. He said, I don't, I don't, that's not the guy that shot me. Wild. It's crazy yeah. that he was able to survive it too, Larry. Mm -hmm. They weren't trying to kill him. They were trying to find out the location of his brother. Um, so they they were they were choking him out, um, but they weren't trying to kill him. If they were trying to kill him, they would have just picked him, you know. Yeah. So what did Anthony think about uh, Michael Francis cooperating? Yeah, he, again, not a fan at any level. You know, I know Michael, his big claim to fame is that no one got locked up, but you still took the stand and testified against his partners. He did not know what the outcome of that was going to be. You know, and then he also testified in a, in a different respect about organized crime in general. But so, his father, he told on his own father. Yeah. So he, he, you know, he's just another one. You batch them all together. They're all in the same boat. And and yes, he's he's a religious guy. He wrote a book. I have it over here on my shelf. Um, it, it, you're still still a rat. You can't you can't you can't undo that. You can't. You know, once you're a rat, you're always a rat. And he won't even admit it. Like you won't even admit it. Yeah. yeah. Did did you or not take the stand against somebody? Did you? You know, you did. Yeah. Did you cooperate to get out of trouble? Yes. Yeah. The bottom line. Yes. I didn't put no one in prison. I didn't do this. They always mm -hmm. have an excuse. All yeah. of them. Yeah. You also promote the you also promote the movement. You know, when you're showing them that um, I got a podcast, I got that's what they all aspire to be, right? Let's not lie. He has the most views out of anybody on the internet. That's a snitch, right? So you have all these other guys that you mentioned before. They're following in the footsteps. It's like, look, look at me. You know, it's, it's 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 this is free money. You could do this just like me. And and the promotion of that to me is just as disgusting as as uh, you know the ratting side too, because now you're you got this whole generation of people who are like. They're looking at the playbook. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna commit crime. I'm gonna work for the government. Uh, you know, look at Sc Scarpa. You, know, you want to talk about a Scarpa thing? I'd love someone if they're gonna do the Scarpa story, which I see like three people have like options to do that story. We, you know, I hope they do an interesting enough to show what did the FBI pay him from the 1960s until he died in the 1980s? What did that guy put in his pocket? Because he was on the payroll. Never mind that they let him operate. He was on the payroll. I knew when he was working with Joe Colombo. He was getting a few thousand dollars a month in the 1960s. So that's that's the 1960s. You know, he had the green and he had the green light to kill. Let's not forget, Lindley Del Vecchio almost went to prison. Um, and 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 if they had any guts, they would have put him in prison. The agent handler during the Persico Arena Wars, knowingly that they were putting Greg Scarpa, giving him the positions and the locations of arena gang members to kill them. Yeah. They, they were pulling people off of their um, their areas where they were um, watching. Surveillance. You know, surveillance surve yeah. yeah, they were pulling people off surveillance so that Scarpa could go in and kill. Lindley Del Vecchio was, was a, 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 a conspiracy to murder Rico. Put him in with everything. Those do relationships. Think, 
Do you think Carmine yeah. Persico knew that Scarpa was cooperating? Personally, I can never know that, right? You could never know that. Is is there is there a possibility that he knew that his guy was involved with them? He's a smart guy. He, he yeah, it, it, it could have been known to him. Did he turn a blind eye to that, right? Like what what would it be? But personally, I, I could never say that against him because he lived his entire life by the code and no one ever proved that wrong, right? No one ever got the opportunity to say, this guy knew, you know, he did. But, but Larry I mean, Larry Mazza made a statement that. Larry Allie, Mazza would, would know better than me. That's all I got to say. He said Alley Boy and Carmine knew the whole time. Yeah. It's, it's look. The evidence is there. What you will, what you will make from it, you know, your your hypothesis based on all this evidence, you know, is that he could have. Yeah, he definitely could have. There was a lot of evidence out there that would have said that he know he he knows what's going on. Um, but could I personally say that? Uh, no, I can't. You know, you never know. He could it could have been one of these guys. Was like, nah, nah, not him, not him. He's just fucking lucky. <laughs> yeah, I, and I hear that. Uh, Michael Francis paid Carmine Persico a lot of money after he cooperated not to kill him. Hmm. That's a possibility too. I, I I know that you know one of the things too was uh, Persico had talked about the Arena War. The I mean I'm sorry Persico Francis he talked about the Persico and Arena War like about sides and, and he wasn't even involved. Like he you know he puts himself in a lot of stuff. He put him I mean he basically put himself next to Joe Colombo when Colombo was shot. And it's like, no, you weren't. I've, I've reviewed so much footage of that day. You, you were nowhere to be found. But he was involved in a very interesting story during a protest at the FBI offices on First Avenue, um, which, you know, I think I wrote about it in the book. It was, it was a time where they actually interacted and had a, had a scuffle with all of the cops. Um, and I know he was there that day. You know, I, I, it was always interesting to me. You know, these guys, man, they just can't keep to the facts. They have to go ahead and tell these other stories instead of just like some of the stuff you've done is actually good enough to just leave it alone. But once they knew they had the green light, man, and no one's going to stop them, they just keep on taking. Like, care. yeah, he handed me some uh, pamphlets and told mm -hmm. me, go hand these out. And then I walked, I started walking away and I heard the shots right yeah. behind me. Yeah. And there's blood on my pamphlet. And, you know, <laughs> it's like, like it's yeah, I, I saw him on the Vlad TV thing. And, you know, I just I don't know. Uh, I just don't. Uh, I don't I don't agree with him having to tell the non truths, just stick to the truth. And for, for you know. For him, you wrote a book. If you didn't write it in the book, don't don't start changing stuff now because that's when you were really on point when you were doing that. And now Sammy too. Sammy was uh, knows who killed Hoffa. He was huh. all this crazy nonsense. He was on the moon landing. Yeah. Tell him, Sammy. <laughs> you know, yeah. Sammy's an interesting one. Sammy always denied the the um this 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 whole Joe Colombo. I met Joe Colombo. It's a farce. Uh, and and the story, you know, a lot of people have. I saw a lot of people would comment back, "This never happened." Anthony talks about beating up uh, Sammy the Bull. Um, I always say, "Well, why didn't it happen?" Because you were there. Um, you know, he he tells the honest story because Sammy made it like he beat up the Colombo brothers. He didn't. He did take shots on Joe Junior. Joe Junior was a little bit younger, a little bit smaller. And, and, you know, the story, as you saw on the video goes that Anthony, he told me, he was, I walked, I knew my brother got beat up. I knew who did it. They were young kids, maybe 14 years old at the time. You know, so it was a simple little kid fight. He walks into the row in front of where he is. He turns around. Sammy's looking at him and Anthony just started unloading on him. And he goes, and I threw so many punches and hit him in the face so many times that years later, when we were both in the ramparts, a little street gang from Brooklyn. We were kids, my brother Joey and I, I was about 12, he was about 10. We used to go to Lowy's Oriental uh, in Brooklyn. And uh, one Saturday afternoon, uh, my brother Joey got in an altercation with uh, Sammy the Bull. Uh, Sammy the Bull was a couple of years older than my brother, and uh, my brother got the worst of it. Uh, when I found out, I went in uh, the aisle where Sammy the Bull was sitting, 
and uh, for lack of a better term, I beat the living shit out of his face with my fist, and I did a good job on Sammy the Bull, because the story he told in his book is utterly fabricated and bullshit, in plain English. Uh, it never happened. We were 12 years old. He never met my father, like he said in the book, and I know he's still alive, and he's maybe when he's listening to this, he'll remember the story. We were standing out in front of the candy store, and I knew who he was, and he knew who I was. So this girl, he must have never forgotten that day, because this girl says, there he is. There's Anthony Colombo. Go ahead and get your get at him. And he said he looked at Sammy. Sammy looked at him, and Sammy didn't want a piece of him. Maybe a year later, uh, I joined the gang, uh, the Rampers, and Sammy the Bull was also in that street gang. There was a lot of street gangs in Brooklyn at the time. And I ran into Sammy the Bull at the candy store, which was across the street from uh, New Utrecht High School, schoolyard. Uh, he was with a couple of girls, and uh, the girls knew about the fight we had in the Lowy's Oriental. And one of the girls told Sammy, Sammy, there he is, why don't you go take care of him? Sammy didn't want no part of it. I think he had enough of me, and I think I put a little bit of the fear of God in him, into him uh, with the fight we had. Not that it was a fight, I just beat the shit out of him. He said, I took the starch out of that kid that day in the movie theater, and he knew that for life. And I wish those two could have went face to face, you know, that at... You know, I, I guess, you know, Sam the Bull's living longer so that he has to live with these demons that he has. And he can deny it. You know, he doesn't feel bad about anything that he ever did. But you're in the mirror by yourself. You know who loves you and who doesn't love you. You probably don't love yourself. You're such an evil human being. So you can't expect other people to love you. So this false love, the podcast, the autographs, the taking pictures with people who they wouldn't. They wouldn't help if you got in trouble, they wouldn't help you a smidgen. They don't care about you as a human being. You're a novelty. You are the new watch or the new jewelry that they want to talk about. Um, but you have no soul. And and I and I I I feel that's why he's alive longer. It's to live yeah. with that. To live, yeah. And um, he says that he wants to change his legacy. He wants to be known as a noble person. And mm. he wants to leave a legacy for his children. He wants a jet and all this shit. Yeah. No, yeah, I'm was... still going to make fun of you after you die, Sammy. So, uh... <laughs> yeah, Yo, legacy. Mm. I will continue to uh, expose him even after he's dead. Yeah, good. Yeah. So. When after when the book came out, what was it like when the book came out? Your book, um, it was it was good. We we were well received. We did a lot of like homegrown book signings and stuff. You know, we our agent passed away uh, when I finished the book, so we didn't get a lot of the uh, attention that other authors were probably getting at the time. So it, it kind of got lost in the in the shuffle. But um, we got. A lot of stuff that we set up on our own was very successful signings. Um, we did some radio, we did some podcasts, some television stuff. Um, and I think re people really enjoyed the story because some of the stuff that we were telling them, they didn't know about, like they didn't know how involved Joe Colombo was in the making of The Godfather. Um, they didn't know that Anthony comes from a family, a pedigree of their parents being killed. You know, Aunt Joe Colombo's father being killed, shot in 1938 and then, you know, so on. You know, he's the first person to break that cycle for his son, Anthony. Um, I think, the, yeah, the father-son story, I always received a lot of uh, a lot of praise for that aspect of the story. Um, and I think the political aspirations of, of Joe Colombo for his son and how much was actually done and accomplished by the league. Matter of fact, I just read somewhere that there's a group of people trying to put a documentary together on the Italian American civil rights league. Um, you know, within that short period of less than two years, the amount of stuff that that group accomplished was, it was Herculean tasks. I mean, they put, you know, 150,000 people in Columbus circle in June, 1970.